tutti and welcome to another edition of Italian America Long Island. My name is Dave Anthony Sutta Ducati. Tonight we're going to be spending some time with one of the most interesting persons I've ever met. He was born in Brooklyn, raised in Syosset, Long Island, so he's a real Long Islander at heart, even though now he resides in Southern Florida. His family has a long Italian heritage, and to this day, he still maintains a lot of the traditional Italian ways. Would you please welcome Mr. Raymond Monoyun. Ray, great to have you on the show. Hey, great to be here, Dave. So, Ray, you have a long Italian heritage. Why don't you tell me a little bit about your family's Italian history? Well, I guess, like most in the U.S. that are Italian, you start with the story of immigration. And I've got to break it up into the two families because they were quite different. My grandfather, on my mom's side, he arrived at age nine. He came over from Sicily with his uncle. Sadly, his uncle died on the ship. So he had to make his way. Now, like all things like this, there's no books, there's no records, there's no diaries. It's just stories passed on through. I've tried to check many times to see if I could find out all these things that occurred. I was unsuccessful. So all I can tell you is that grandfather from nine years old made his way in New York to where he eventually owned a coat factory, a chain of florists, and many other successful careers. He wasn't a mega millionaire by our standards now, but for an immigrant person, he was a successful individual wore a Hamburg hat, a vest, spats, carried gloves, and was an eloquent speaker and active in all the Italian societies that you can imagine. So Raymond, by the way you're describing his fashion, I'm saying this is around the turn of the century that it came, or? Yeah, this was probably around 1901 to 1902, as best as I can glean. However, he wore that same outfit until he died in 1959. It did not change. In the summertime, the vest came off. Otherwise, it was the same outfit. On my mother's side, it was quite different. Mom came here on vacation with a very large family with her mother on a cruise ship. And when they arrived, they were surprising her dad, who had come to the U.S. on business. He was a very wealthy businessman in Marsala, Italy, in the big town of Marsala, where Marsala wine <clears throat> comes from. And it was an interesting story because after a week being here, my grandfather, great-grandfather did not arrive as he was supposed to in New York. Upon checking, they found out that he had been killed in Chicago. And there's many stories of many varieties on how he was killed and why. However, my great-grandmother and the rest of the kids stayed a year or two. I'm not quite sure how long that story gets fuzzy because I do need to lead in with one thing. What I'm going to tell you now about my grandmother on my mom's side was quite interesting. We never knew anything growing up, my brother and I, until a few weeks before my grandmother passed away. My wife, Betty, and I were called into the den by my grandmother she didn't know she was dying at the time. She took an illness, went to the hospital, and passed on. She said, I want to tell you a story. And she told us the story of her life. I wish to this day I recorded it. It would have been fabulous. In any event, they came to the United States. They stayed a while. And my great-grandmother decided to go back because they had many real estate holdings and business holdings in Marsala. We eventually, years later, with my kids, and my mom, and my beautiful wife, we went over and visited. The house my grandmother was born in and brought up in now houses four gigantic trucks, 18 apartments, and three smaller homes that were all made up the estate, and they had their own church. To this day, you see the plaque that this is the church of Don Pizzo, P-I-Z-Z-O. So when great-grandma decided to move on and take everybody back. My grandmother, her older sister by a year or so, and her older brother by a few more years, decided they wanted to stay in the United States. 
<clears throat> it was a very important decision because my great grandmother said, you stay in the States, you have nothing. You don't have any of what we had back in Italy. Everybody else went back and they stayed and they had to make their own way. Great grandma was a tough woman, I understand. So the only two things that my grandmother and her sister could do was crochet and sew because that's what the rich ladies did. And when they were educated, they were educated by tutors. There were no public schools back then in Italy. So with, or at least in Sicily, with that, the oldest brother then trained and became a butcher. And they lived in Brooklyn. They both, the two sisters, ended up working in a coat factory. And sometime, and now I can't tell you if they were 18 or 21, but probably closer to 18, my grandmother went out on a two, possibly three dates at the most with a gentleman who turned out to be my grandfather. So the same young man who came over at nine, built himself up, was now working at this coat factory. Mm -hmm. But she didn't know him for long. And after the third date, he said, we're going to get married. She thought he was crazy. Pazzo, as they used to say. All right? But I'll be back in about six months, and we're going to get married. She thought she'd never see him again. You know, the typical expression. Yeah. So six months, almost to the day, they announced the factory's been sold and they were going to meet the new owners. And they all gathered in the major factory area. And there my grandmother sees my grandfather again with his partner, Mr. Bementri, and Maggio, my grandfather. And within 60, 90 days, they were either married or engaged and then eventually got married. And they only had two children, which was my mom and my uncle, God bless, who's still alive and retired in Sarasota, Florida. Kid brother, 10 year difference. Quite a story. I mean, he made such a big financial leap from coming over here to be orphaned, right? Because he came with his, uh, exactly. his uncle. And uh, who took care of him when he, when he came over here? You know? Absolute mystery. I have no idea. But he earned enough money then to fly his sister over from Italy and get her established here. And she had a big family in Belmore that was developed out on the island. And he supported, I can't tell you, how many people he put through med school, how many people he put through pharmacy school, how many men he put through, through uh, uh, becoming attorneys, law school. As such, until I went on my own and moved to Chicago, married, my family, I don't know, ever paid a legal fee, a medical fee, paid for prescriptions or did anything. They were always Felici Maggio's daughter, Felici Maggio's son, Felici Maggio's great-grandson. And when I used to go to societies at Christmas that he was president of, you know, in Italian, Raymond is Ramando. So Ramando Monteleone, Felici Maggio's grandson. You know, and your chest would just yeah. fly out. So switching now to my dad's side, okay. totally different story. Mm -hmm. My dad's side was the typical immigration, came over on the boat with one slight twist. Two teenage kids, I think they were 14, met on the boat, then married off the boat. And it's either they were married at 15 or they were married at 16, etc. And until they both died approximately age 75, the two of them, they were together. And then they had four sons. That's my dad. Depression, age 12, started working with his brothers. At Friday nights, whatever he made, delivering from a pharmacy or working at a grocery store, was deposited on the dining room table, and my grandfather would dole out what they had after he pulled out for food, pulled out for rent, etc. The only beautiful thing, my dad was a fairly intelligent man, very intelligent man. He was the only out of 22 grandsons of his parents' family and so on that went to college. Two others went to college after World War II under the GI Bill, and they were teachers. But my dad went to college, graduated number one in his class in three years, made a tough situation for me because he believed in studies, not social life, not sports, just studies. So after college, he went to work in the same pharmacy he started to work with when he was age 12 as a delivery boy. 
And I think eventually that fellow wanted to sell him the pharmacy, the owner. However, this was now World War II had begun in Europe. Things were gearing up, and my dad, through my grandfather, who was very well connected, got a job at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And because of his college degree, he got hired right away. And eventually, this very five foot seven, 129 on a wet day man became the head rigger for the Brooklyn Navy Yard for the big ships mm -hmm. that were there. And from the never practiced as a pharmacist again, worked there until after the war, he went to work for my grandfather in the florist shops. And thank God when the florist shops closed up and for whatever reason, another mystery, my dad did not get the business. Because of his college degree, he was able then to get an executive position with National Airlines, the big competitor of Easton that was there at the time. And so it was a totally different life. He met my mom either just after or around graduation from college, which was 1939. In those days, they had the expression, keeping company. Yeah. So they kept company and got married in 41, okay? And my brother was born in 43. That was on there. And <clears throat> they absolutely brought us up Italian. Now, we lived over my grandmother's, my mom's mom, who was a great cook. My mom was a career woman. She was controller of an American stock exchange company, but only had one semester of college because my grandfather, the nine-year-old who grew up mm -hmm. successful, thought women should not work. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, women should not go to college. Okay. They should work, but they shouldn't go to okay. college. Okay. All right? So with all that, I was a latchkey child almost. When we lived in Brooklyn till we moved to Syosset, I had grandma there. And grandma took care of me. Grandma made sure I got to school safe. Grandma made sure I got home from school safe. And it was so on. And the neighborhood was very bad, very bad. But thank God we survived, moved out to Syosset, and then it became heaven. So the Italian heritage of pasta every night, two course meals with bread, uh, I mean, was, was fabulous. It was really fabulous. My dad's family was much more conservative. My mother's family was not. They liked to live it up. My grandfather, of nine, the same nine-year-old guy again, he had season tickets at the Metropolitan Opera. Mm. My other grandfather, he loved to watch TV. So it was totally different setup. But it was very interesting on how they brought us up. It, uh, family, or what we called familia, okay, family and friends, the two Fs, were the most important thing in life. And just as you and I know, we've known each other since we were in seventh grade, 1959. I believe in that tradition and you do. And then there's always funny stories I could tell you about things, especially about going back to Italy. I don't know, had I ever told you, Dave, about the story of my mom? Oh, I want to hear this. I want to hear this. this is a great story. I know it's a great story if it's coming from you, Raymond. <laughs> Thank you. So. My mom was 70, and for her birthday, we said, Mom, didn't you say you have an invitation, one of your cousins has a wedding in Sicily, in Marsala area? She says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mom, we're going to send you over for three weeks. That'll be your birthday gift. Because in the meantime, if I'm not mistaken, it was the same year my daughter graduated high school, and we went on a trip. I had to do business, and we had to do pleasure. So we were going almost a month, and we went to various places in Europe, okay, mostly Southern Europe, and had a good time plus mixture with work. And then my mom flew over. And this cute story really starts there. I was a frequent flyer to Europe, so I had the highest ranking member of British Air's flight club. So of course, to use some points to get some extra treatment, I get my mom flown over business class on British Air. She, being the staunch Italian, even though born in the United States, she wanted to fly all Italia. But it was my mistake, we put her on British Air, and she had to have a stop in London to switch over to fly to, and she got a flight directly to Palermo from London. So, we're on our trip and we're having a blast, and I believe we were in the south of France but not Monaco yet. And I 
we get back from one of our excursions, the business was now over, and it was all social, and the concierge says, Mr. Montalioni, because in Europe, you have to pick up your key at the desk. You don't take it with you. And I'm getting the key. He says, here's a message your mom called. It's urgent. So I get the phone. There's my mom on the phone. Hi, mom. How are you? Oh, you and this British air should have been all Italian. They lost my luggage. I got a wedding in two days, and I got no dress to wear. This is disgusting. Why do you fly such a terrible airline? And she's really getting on me big time. And I said, Ma, just use my number. Call this number up. Tell them who I am. They'll let you buy whatever you want, which indeed is what she did. And she got a beautiful dress for the wedding and had a good time at the wedding. After the wedding, we have a calm phone call, and that calm phone call is, I'm going tomorrow to go visit your grandfather's side of the family, because now she's with her, grandma, with her grandmother's side of the family, the one who had gone to New York on vacation. <laughs> I said, great, Mom. Yeah, he's president of the bank in Portana, up there in the mountains. We're going to have lunch. One of my cousins from here, the Pizzo family, is going to drive me up. Great. We get back, I think we were on a, either a cruise or we had chartered a boat or something that day. So we're in bathing suits and so on and having fun. New concierge, new hotel. I think that one was Monaco, but if it wasn't, it was Nice. And Mr. Marlioni, you have an emergency message from your mom. What? Oh my God, get up to the room, dial. My wife's standing next to me. We're all wondering what's happening, the kids. Ma, what's wrong? Oh, what a day. Cousin such and such died today. He did. After lunch or before lunch. On my way there, must have been a block away. He died, police were there and everything. Oh my God, what happened? He had a heart attack. I said, no, I feel bad. When's the funeral? You know, are you going to go to the funeral? No, you don't go to this funeral. He had a heart attack. Ma, what do you mean you don't go to the funeral? Your cousins don't want to drive you up? You don't go. He had a heart attack. And then finally I said, Ma, I don't understand. You are stupid. And she hangs up. So now we're going nuts. And a few days later, we all fly into Palermo. We get into Palermo Airport, and I say, Betty and Tara, my daughter, go see if you can find Mom out there. She was supposedly getting a ride up. We had rented a limo, but a ride up from the cousins. And then she'd get in the limo with us. We spent a few days in Palermo. So Betty and Tara go. Nick and I go to try to get the luggage. Sadly, the flight that was supposed to land before us was late. And there were all these people trying to get their luggage, not understanding, even though they were Italian themselves, that their bags were not coming off. Our bags were coming off. Their plane hadn't unloaded. And I'm trying to excuse me, this and that. And my Italian, very poor, very poor. My son, who at the time was barely a teenager, okay, and he's, you know, he's saying, Dad, you want me to push this guy? No, no, Nick, calm down. Be okay. Then all of a sudden, it's as if the Red Sea parted. Two guys with sunglasses and suits walk up, and the people move. And Nick and I are standing there, and he says, Cugino Montaleone. Yeah, yeah, Ray Montaleone, Nick Montaleone, my son. Don't you worry, you just point out the bags. And we point out the bags, they take the bags and we leave. Then the Red Sea closes again and we walk out. There's Betty with Tara, my daughter, and my mother. And I don't remember, it was either three or four cars, no one car. It was a caravan of people. The limo driver was there and he's saying, do you really need me to take it? Oh yeah, we're going to go in the limo to the hotel. So we get in the limo. The rest are following us, and we're going to get something to eat at the hotel before they drive back to Marsala. In the car, my mother's real quiet, and I'm saying, Ma, I don't understand what I'm just not. Well, it turns out that the heart attack was my mother's code word that somebody shot this guy going into the bank. Oh, my God. Well, this was like my mother was unbelievable about this. Betty didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. Nothing. And this festered for the whole trip in Sicily. And we had a blast. The kids, we, they, they threw a birthday party for my mom. We took over a whole restaurant there. It was wonderful. All right, we're now leaving there, and we're flying from Palermo to Rome. 
because we're going to spend three, four days in Rome with my mom and have fun. And we had a suite which had a room, bedroom with two queen-size beds and in the other room, living room, and then a king-size bed for Betty and I. And the plan was that the three, my brother, excuse me, my mother, my son, and my daughter were going to share that room. Mm -hmm. Okay. We land, and the limo driver in Rome has got a sign up Monleone, and he's a young guy. We got to know him pretty well. He ended up, he was going to law school and just doing this on the side. And this kid was shaking. So I walk up to him, I introduce myself. He says, you're from the United States? I said, yeah. He says, oh my God. There's been all these killings in Sicily this week, and I saw this Monteleone family coming from Sicily. We not only have the limo, we have another U-Haul truck for all the luggage, because we were gone for a month, plus my daughter packs like you can't believe. Mm -hmm. And in any event, so, and I, I didn't know what I was picking up. So he felt relieved that we were from Florida, and this and that, etc. And as we get into the car with my mom, I said to him, so calm down, you have nothing to worry about like that. He says, oh yeah, it's all over the papers. People being killed. My son flirts out, yeah, one of them was our cousin. Oh my God. My mother didn't talk to my son the rest of the trip. She just totally was upset about this. He had broken the code. My son thought it was the coolest thing in the world, right at that age. He thought it was cool. So that was the visit to Italy. And I don't, I, until this year for our 50th anniversary, I don't think our kids have been back, but I couldn't remember. But Betty and I have been back many times after that, etc. because we just love the place. Plus the food's excellent and, and you, like that. Your so. mother, of course, and your dad, and I knew them both well, wonderful people. Your mother, such a strong personality. Your father, too. I mean, two unique people personalities in the same family, uh, your mother so strong, so effusive, so full of life, and let everyone know that she was full of life. Your father was a little bit more uh, restrained and reserved, but as intense as any other person I've ever met in my life, so intense. David, you're understating how quiet and laid back he was, but he was like the old E.F. Hutton commercials. He didn't say much, but when he spoke, people listened. Yeah. And my mother, her name was really Rosina. She mm -hmm. was born Little Rose. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that's what he called her, except when she was in trouble with him. Then it was Rose, and then oh, boom, my brother boy. and I would back off, <laughs> and that would be it, and she would calm right down, etc. But it, but it was interesting. And we tried to bring up our kids to believe in family and so on. I think we've been fairly successful. Now, neither one married Italian. One married an Irishman, right. American Irish. Right. Uh, and the other married someone else from Europe, but not Italian. Right. And, but they're, they're bringing up their kids the same way. So our five granddaughters, okay, they love the big dinners on the Sundays or holidays. And they come over a lot, especially the youngsters. The five love to cook. Cooking sauce with grandma is like the max thing to do. And so the whole family really enjoys you the know, whole thing. Listening to your story, Ray, about your grandfather and how he supported so many people gives me a great insight to your personality because I know that's where you got your generosity from. And I know uh, in conversations with you and visits with you how important it is for you to in turn give back not only to your family but to the community. And I know that you're very active down here in South Florida in many of these charitable things. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's an insight for me. This is where you get it from. And uh, the thing I have to ask you, though, the uh, original uh, unfortunate demise of Don Pizzo, was that ever solved as a criminal case? I don't think so. And what's really interesting, my grandmother used to come and babysit after my daughter was born, even when we lived in Chicago, because since we were going to be traveling to New York then, then when we moved to North Carolina, we had to travel to both places on holidays, both Chicago and New York, to see the families. Betty used to work, she's a sweetheart, my wife, so she used to work, save enough money with me so we could fly somewhere with the kids. Well, Grandma Maggie was in Chicago then, at least one of those periods, if not two. She never once told us her father was buried in Chicago, so we never knew when we lived there. So it was nothing at all. 
So until she told us just before she died, okay, which was in the 80s, yeah, not her age, the year, and uh, we didn't know any of it. When I tried to talk to my uncle, who's still alive, he knew very little, if anything, about it. So it was one of those hush-hush situations. What do I believe? You know, you watch TV, you watch these stories. I could fabricate in my mind, you know, Don Pizzo, the guy who ran Marsala. Or he could have just been a young soldier. I don't know. I can't tell. But it's clear to me he didn't die of pneumonia. Yeah. Okay? So now, Remy, I want to get on to a little uh, sensitive subject. Because I know you have revealed to me in one of our previous conversations something very important that your father told you before he died. Would you be willing to share that with the audience? All right. I spoke to my dad the last time he was alive. It was on Father's Day in 1977. And my dad died of cancer very young. He was barely 62. And he said to me, he said, you know, son, I know you're flying out next week. But he must have had a premonition because I was flying out the next Friday to see him. That's, that maybe he wasn't going to make it. So he got real serious and he said, I want you to promise me something. I said, sure, Dad, what do you need? You know, he might bring something out to you next week. He said, no, no, promise me if something happens to me that you take care of your mother. Sure, Dad, of course, no problem. Take care of your brother. I had an older brother. No problem, I swear. And he said, you know, you're smart. You went to college. You're doing real well. Promise me you won't go to work for the mom. And I'm shocked. And I said, Dad, what even made you think of that? He said, you know, you're really bright. Who knows what could happen and who could entice you? So I promised him. And to this day, I haven't. Never thought of it since then and haven't done it. I must have told you the story on some night when I was sitting there worrying during my career, saying, oh my God, now i got to do this and i got to do that. Maybe it would have been easier. Okay? <laughs> but that would have been the wrong well, answer. You might have been there to put a heart on back sometime. <laughs> that would have been the wrong answer at the, at the time. But yeah, that happened. Raymond, you're amazing. You're such a wonderful speaker. And I think everyone's going to love this episode. I want to thank you once again for sharing these Thanks great stories. Thanks for the stories. opportunity. God bless you. You too.